So a quick overview of this presentation. We are starting with the introduction and motivation. Then we move into the methods, the experiments and discussion, and finally, the conclusions. Okay, let's start now with the background of human activity recognition, or HAR. Well, HAR consists of methods to automatically infer from sensor data what activity an individual is performing. We are here concentrating on HAR using wearable sensors, and this field has several applications in areas such as healthcare, smart home systems, sign language translation, virtual reality, among others. Usually, HAR for wearable sensors use multiple sensor channels as its input, and we refer to sensor channel as a stream of data of a specific modality, for example, accelerometers or gyroscopes, placed on a specific part of the user's body. For instance, an accelerometer placed on the wrist is a sensor channel, just like a magnetometer placed on the subject's back is also a sensor channel. So what methods are currently used to solve HAR? The state of the art in HAR consists of deep learning methods as they have been delivering impressive performance without a need for feature engineering. However, deep learning requires large amounts of computational resources, often beyond low-cost off-the-shelf microcontrollers. So the question is how do we reduce this computational resource consumption of deep learning? Well, we can restrain the number of sensor channels because a lower number of sensor channels means a smaller input to the neural network and then a lower complexity. But reducing the number of sensor channels may result in significant performance degradations. So when we're moving the number of sensor channels from the input, we want to do in a way such that the removed channels provide negative no or negligible contribution to the performance of the hard classifier. And this task, this selection, is called sensor channel selection. The difference between sensor channel selection and compression techniques, new network compression techniques, is that in compression techniques, the aim is to minimize the neural network complexity, whereas in sensor channel selection, the goal is to minimize the input complexity. A common approach to sensor channel selection is by employing exhaustive search. However, this approach is not scalable, especially for deep learning, because as we increase the number of sensor channels, the number of possible combinations of these channels increases exponentially. So exhaustive search is not an efficient way of performing sensor channel selection. Another approach is by creating several weak classifiers, each weak classifier for a sensor channel, and then performing a classifier selection. But by doing this, it doesn't allow for inter-channel dependencies learning, which means that features that come from relationship among sensor channels are not learned. Another way that only works in shallow learning scenarios is feature selection. Usually, in shallow learning scenarios, each feature comes from only one sensor channel. So if we perform feature selection and all the features that come from a specific sensor channel are removed, then we are certainly performing sensor channel selection. However, this is not the case for deep learning. In deep learning, the features that are learned are a black box. They come from a combination of all the sensor channels in an unpredictable way. So employing feature selection to deep learning does not help with the goal of sensor channel selection. So what we're doing here in this work is proposing a pipeline that's able to spot and select relevant and non-redundant sensor channels more efficiently during the training procedure of a deep learning neural network. So here in this table, we have a short comparison between our work and other works in human activity recognition including in sensor channel selection. So with respect to the classification performance, we can achieve as high performance as those methods that employ all the sensor channels. We have a lower resource consumption. So what's also important to say is that our method, our pipeline, ranked channels by their importance, which is not found in the literature. 
Also, the duration of the training can be faster than other sensor channel selection methods and much faster than exhaustive search. So let's move on to the methods now. We start by training a classifier for a certain number of pokes. We pause the training, we extract the classifier's weights, and with an algorithm, we rank the sensor channels according to their contribution to the classification performance. Also with an algorithm, we find out if there are any redundant or irrelevant sensor channels in use. If there are, we exclude them and we train the classifier. The training then resumes with a reduced number of, class reduced number of sensor channels and reduced classifier size. When there are no more redundant or irrelevant sensor channels in use, we end the training and with an algorithm, we rank all the known excluded sensor channels according to their contribution to the classification task. During inference time, we can use all the non-excluded sensor channels or a subset of them according to the available computational resources. We move on to the neural network architecture. Here we have the sensor channels at the input and the first layer is a random channel dropout layer, which means that only during the training, some channels are dropped out. We imply this dropout so that our neural network is robust to different combination of sensor channels. After the dropout come the inception blocks. There is an inception block for each sensor channel. So inside these inception blocks, there are basically a handful of convolutions. After the inception block, all the channels, all the features that come from different channels are fused in the channel fusion block. At the later step, we have the LSTM layer to learn some temporal dependencies. And finally, after a dense layer, fully connected layer, we have the class prediction. In the channel fusion block, the features of each channel are merged by a weighted sum. The weights of the sum are learned parameters in the range from 0 to 1. The neural network in the pipeline is then trained with an objective function or a loss function that instructs it to minimize the use of redundant and irrelevant information across sensor channels while of course maintaining high performance. This is done by minimizing the entropy of the vector containing the weights of the sum. Apart from the cross entropy that's usually used for classification tasks. So the basic idea behind a sensor channel selection is that we use the weights of the sum in the channel fusion block to rank the sensor channels by their contribution. We use the weights as well and a validation set to infer if a sensor channel is or not redundant. So we now move on to the experiments. Starting by the setup, we use five public data sets, PMAP2, Toughnet, Opportunity, mHealth, and Skoda. This data set includes daily life activities such as running, jogging, standing, sitting, walking, ascending stair, descending stair, picking up an object, and so forth. To compare our pipeline, we have five baselines. The first one is InnoR, which includes simply all the sensor channels. Then we have sensor channel selection methods such as HQA, PBN, MR, MR, EP, and NBF plus exhaustive search. So these methods are all implemented on a Raspberry Pi 4B microcontroller. And as evaluation metrics, we use F1 score, memory footprint, inference time, and energy consumption per prediction. We move on to the quantitative results. As we can see in the table, our method is able to deliver F1 scores close to the case where all sensor channels are utilized. We use from 76% to 93% less memory than our baselines. 45% to 75% faster prediction and energy consumption is on average 56 to 76% smaller than the baselines. As mentioned previously, our pipeline is able to rank sensors by their contribution. And at inference time, instead of utilizing all the selected sensor channels, we can use only a subset of sensor channels, the best subset of them to reduce even further resource consumption. In this table, we show that there is a reasonable performance degradation when utilizing a subset of selected sensor channels. Let's move on now to the qualitative results. 
At the top here, we see all the available sensor channels for all five data sets. Each sensor channel type has a different color. At the bottom here, we see again for all five different data sets, the selected sensor channels and in gray, the removed sensor channels. Now let's pay attention to this SCOTA data set. We see that before the selection, we have many sensors placed very close to each other, which can probably mean re redundancy. If sensors are placed very close to each other, they are capturing most likely the same information, which means redundancy. After the sensor channel selection, we notice that the clutter of very close to each other sensor channels is not present anymore, which is a sign of redundancy removal. This is also the case for opportunity in these sensors, the sensor channels that are placed on the biceps and on the wrists. As for relevance removal, we notice that for the PAMAP2 dataset, the heart rate sensor was removed. In this dataset, we have activities such as running, jogging, jumping, cycling, ascending stair, descending stair, rope jumping, which are all activities that have approximately the same heart rate. So for this data set, it's reasonable to say that the heart rate sensor is an irrelevant sensor channel. This is also the same case for the mHealth data set, which have very similar activities and both heart rate sensors were removed after the selection. In these cases of redundancy and irrelevance removal, we can see consistency of results between datasets. Talking about the ranking of the sensor channels, we see that, for example, in a PMAP2 dataset, the accelerometers that are able to spot, to react to a higher amplitude of accelerations are those preferred. This is understandable because in motions such as running, these sensors are not easily saturated, so they can convey more information. In the mHealth dataset, the most discriminative channels were listed as the ankles and chest accelerometers. Well, in fact, 9 out of 10 activities can be well differentiated by the patterns of movements of, from the chest and the ankle for this mHealth dataset. The SCOTA dataset is comprised of activities that use only hands. And for this data set, we notice that sensors placed on the wrist are ranked higher than those sensors placed on, for example, the upper arm on the deltoid muscle. The reason for this is that, naturally, we can expect a higher amplitude of motion on the wrist than on the deltoid muscle, and therefore, more information is available for us from the sensors on the wrist. To wrap up, our pipeline is lightweight, it is insightful, it contains information on the contribution of each sensor channel, which is also useful to create guidelines for human activity recognition systems. It is modular because it can use a different numbers of sensor channels at runtime, and robust because by changing the number of sensor channels at runtime, we only get a reasonable performance degradation. As limitations, we have slow convergence, but yet our pipeline is faster than training several weak classifiers and much faster than employing exhaustive search. Also, it is static with respect to the context and subject, but this is solvable with some modifications in the future. Finally, some physical prototypes to collect data are needed, so our method, our pipeline, does not exclude the burden of data collection. As conclusion, we have a sensor channel selection pipeline with a modular neural network that learns to minimize the use of sensor channels by understanding the redundancy and relevancy relationships between them. We have shown qualitative and quantitative results in favor of our pipeline and in comparison with the baselines. Finally, the pipeline can be also applied to other multi-input problems in deep learning with little or no modifications because the methods here are general. With this, we conclude the presentation. Thank you for your attention.